at it um, on Moodle. All right. But let's go ahead and get started. As we talked about in the classroom last week, or earlier this week, and even part of the of last Friday, management is how one gets all of this organized. How you get business going. How you create a value proposition, which drives a profit, which then goes to shareholders. But extra money from the profit can also be reinvested, which allows you to create more of a value proposition, which allows you to continue to grow your business. And as you get larger, organizing all of that activity has to be something that is, is handled and done as things change. And that's what management is all about, becoming good at that. Those relatively straightforward steps, very complicated and difficult, specifically in the specific situations, but it's pretty much the same story in any of these business cases. And that's what we'll, we'll dive into a little more. I'll talk about how that process works. Um, we also talked about these functions of management, planning, organizing, staffing, directing, and controlling. We talked about these various pieces of, uh, of management as well. And we talked about these various roles. Oops, hold it. Back it up. We talked about these various roles that people thought, oh, sorry about this. These various roles that people have. They have is the informational, that is monitoring what's going on, disseminating information, acting as the spokesperson, making decisions as the entrepreneur, all of these various things and negotiating situations when they arise, handling disturbances and the like. So there's various things that we do as well. We talked about all of that. In addition, you have to think about breaking down an organization into various areas or various functions. There's financials, the financial management. There's production and operations. There's human resources, the people parts of the business. There's marketing. And then there's this sort of administrative function, the glue that holds it all together. So let me just say a few words about each of these um, in a little more detail. Financial information, financial management, we talk about it as accounting, we talk about it as finance, but it's really the language of business in the sense that you don't know if you make a profit unless you can figure out how all your expenses and everything you pay out the door, all the checks you write, versus all the money that you get from your credit card transactions or your or people paying you cash or whatever, how all of that plays out and whether or not a particular thing that you're doing is making you money. Unless you could figure that all out, you really are unable to, to do this process of value proposition, profit, reinvestment, um, giving money to shareholders, continuing to create value, continuing to make a profit. Unless you know how all the pieces fit together in dollars and cents, you can't be sure you can keep that going, right? So that's why you need accounting, and that's why you need finance. And it's fully integrated into the process. Now, on a certain sense, it sounds easy, right? If somebody gives you a dollar, and it costs you 50 cents to give them what you're giving them, it's pretty easy, and maybe you could do that in your head. The problem is, in organizations, it starts to get muddled rather quickly. In fact, beyond muddled, it starts to get downright confusing because what you have happening is you have, you have to buy things sometimes months or even years before you sell them to get the money that you're using to build them, to get the money that you use to build them. So sometimes you have to borrow money to build what you need in order to sell it later or you have to use money from what you did yesterday to build something that you're going to sell tomorrow but tomorrow can be a year, tomorrow can be five years, tomorrow can be six years, and the money that you get could have been something that was designed years ago. The life cycle of an automobile, five or six years between design, getting it into the production cycle, buying all the supplies, doing all the engineering and safety tests, and getting it out on the road, right? So you have all of these timing problems. A drug, for example, in the pharmaceutical industry 
with all of the clinical trials and the testing and making sure that nobody gets sick from it or there aren't any side effects and doing various levels of trials that are all regulated to make sure that drugs aren't produced that have, have side effects and have problems for people, that could be a nine-year cycle between the time the drug is invented and all of the dollars and cents go into the research for creating the drug and the time people actually start paying for it, which is one of the reasons why drugs are so expensive. Right, managing that process. So you have all of these time delays. Plus, you sometimes invest in equipment that builds five or 10 or 15 products. So you don't really know how to assign that piece of equipment to the, piece, to the particular product that you're selling. So how do you know what all your costs and expenses are associated with the value propositions that you have for all of your different products? So I hope you can see, as we're talking through this, that it gets complicated really, really fast. That's, the, that's part of the problem. And that's one of the reasons why we all have this thing called management. Okay? That's because we have to figure this all out. And it changes, and you have to make decisions all the time. And that's what we do. Financial management helps you figure out that you can continue to have this, this sort of building on itself, growing flywheel of a business that brings in money because of a value proposition, and the profit is reinvested and continues. Unless you could figure that all out with dollars and cents and a sharpened pencil and computer programs and all that, you can easily get yourself into trouble. And it happens a lot. And we can have some offline discussions about that. Okay? That's financial management. Operations is what you're doing, how you're actually doing all of those roles that I was describing. You're, you're building your automobiles or you're in your R&D operation in the company and making the drugs I was describing and going through all those clinical trials, managing all the people that are involved, getting the potential, in, in the pharmaceutical example, or any marketing trial, getting all the people that are involved. in that drop that time. Sorry. One of the uh, difficulties of these sorts of things. Okay? Um, well, one other thing I wanted to point out. If you want to make a comment or answer a question, uh, just typing in the chat can be hard for me to because I'm trying to concentrating on what I'm saying as well as uh, as thinking about what to do next, and there's lots of various things going on on the screen. So if you raise your hand, I know you're interested, and then you could type it in, or I can turn your mic on. Okay? So it's easier if you want to comment to um, to, uh, to to first raise your hand. I'm trying to understand your comment, Karen. N M N V M. Um, I hope you can hear me now. Let's put it that way. Can you hear me now? Raise your hands, please. Okay. All right. Thank you. And uh, again, apologize for that technical glitch. If you put your hands down, I'd appreciate it. All right, Kayla. Okay. Hands down. All right. Excellent. All right, so let me, uh, let me pick up where I, where I was. Uh, again, sorry about that. Um, the production and operations functions, they, they do all the work. Um, when you're running, when you go into a retail store and you're behind, someone's behind a register, somebody's stocking the shelves, managing those processes, a call center, how the call center works, a warehouse, um, managing a grocery store, all of those are operations. Uh, when you're building something, making a product, even doing software development or developing a game or something like that for a video game, um, that's all production and operations. So you have to figure out how to do that well, how to hire the people or use the people effectively, what resources you need. Um, and of course, all of that also has a financial component, so there's a connection there. But if you think about it, they're very different things. Adding it all up and figuring out how the profits are working is one job. Actually doing all that work is a different job, but there's a real connection there, right, to make sure everything uh, fits together. 
Human resource management is the idea of making sure you have the right people and the right jobs. It's kind of straightforward. Um, and there's a lot of good research and development, I mean, excuse me, human resource courses here at Adelphi that talk about hiring problems, hiring issues and how you, uh, how you talk to people and interview them, uh, what sorts of, uh, of, um, of regulations you have to go on, how you have to deal with those kinds of situations, how you find the right people, how you design compensation programs, benefits, those kinds of things uh, to make sure that you're, you have the right people that have the right skills and that you're rewarding them and compensating them fairly and appropriately so they can do production and operations and or they can add up and subtract all the profits and money and all of that so you know for sure your business is continuing to fund itself. That's the human resource management piece of it. The marketing management side is making sure that your value proposition is in line with what the market is looking for and that you know who your customers are that are interested or will use your product or service and is willing to pay the value profit for the value proposition is going to make that commitment or that payment to make to meet that and buy it identify the right people and then continue to send your message to them that you have the product available and that you want their business, right? There's a lots of ways that you can make mistakes in the marketing area. You can have a great value proposition, but you can be, you could fail to find your people and then market to the wrong people. For example, you may have the greatest car in the world, like a Lamborghini, but if you market it to people that are living in a, a, a middle-class neighborhood in Long Island, none of them can afford it. You may think I don't have a good value proposition, but it's really that you just have not identified and been able to communicate with your actual market, which will appreciate or can appreciate, is in a position to take advantage of your value proposition. So you've got to identify those people. You've got to find them and you've got to communicate with them so that you know you have that product and you know it's the value proposition that they want and not what somebody in that middle class neighborhood might respond to because you can't market the same way to different people. You have different value propositions and different target markets. So it's figuring all of that out is your marketing function as well. Then administrative management is how all these pieces fit together. There's administration really in all of these areas, but it's mostly it's identified as separate because there's an entirely different function when you think about it of making sure that the, uh, the, the clocks work and the trains run and all those sorts of things. It's not really trains, but you know what I mean, that the lights come on and you have all of that happening, but that the people are paid in the right schedule, that the payroll works and um, all of those kinds of functions, that, that all the, the right taxes are taken out, uh, people are cared for, that all the policies are handled, all the taxes are paid. Of course, that's finance as well, but all of that administration is also part of it. So as you think about business, you start out thinking small, like you're running the whole thing yourself. But as the business gets larger and larger and management gets larger and larger, it breaks off into what boils down to these basic functions. Okay? And one of the things to be thinking about if you're considering a career in business is which of these areas do you find the most engaging? Not only in, in terms of your own passions, but also where are you skilled? Because you really do want to find what you're good at, if you find something that you like and you're good at it, then it's not really work. I've got to tell you that. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. And you find something that you're good at so that you get a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, of sense of satisfaction because you're successful and you like it, then you can become really very successful because you both like it, you want to do it, you spend a lot of time thinking about it, you get better at it, you want to succeed, and you do succeed, and you get rewarded, and it's a wonderful thing when that happens. So one of the things to be thinking about is how you go about doing that, how you find those things that you want. Any questions or comments on this, on the areas of management? Nope? Okay. There's also levels in management. By and large, we tend to think about the first line managers, which are the people that you meet when you walk in and you go to a store and something happens to your 
order and you say, I want to talk to the manager, right? The shift manager or the person that you report to if you're working in a fast food place or a retail shop. Those are your first line managers. They have what are called individual contributors that report to them. They're the ones that are, that the work is being done and they're the first level of people that communicate uh, or that are worried about the whole business. And that's why they're called first line, first line that does that. Everyone that reports to them is an individual contributor, by and large. And then on the flip side, at the top of the pyramid, is top management, the person in charge, the people in charge, the C-suite, CFO, CEO, vice presidents, people that are, have general management roles, which means essentially they spend their time hearing what other people are saying, getting status reports, thinking about strategic issues, um, and making decisions. Some of those decisions about who to place where, who to hire, um, if there's some issues in terms of compensation or whatever, uh, dealing with product problems, dealing with issues like that and making decisions about it. Those, those are the people at the top. We tend, tend to think of those two. The person that you walk in and you meet, um, who's the manager of a particular operation, or those that are at the very top. But there's an awful lot, in fact, most of one's career, um, if, you're, uh, if you're in business and you succeed in business, most of your career will be spent in this middle management section where you're essentially trying to figure out how to handle them, if you're in marketing, how to decide on your marketing budget and which products you want to market, you want to spend more advertising dollars on, and what what operations, um, what sort of a market research you need for the various products that you have. And then you have other people that run teams doing all of these various things. So if you have managers reporting to you and you report to somebody else in the organization, that's called middle management. So we're all up and down that chain. And one of the things that you learn when you move from first line management up to middle management on the way to the top management, although few people get to top management, but on the way up when you get promoted a few times or once or twice or whatever, is you learn that what you're, you are is a cog in the wheel in a sense, and what your job is is to clarify for yourself but also for others what the nature of the situation is, what challenges are being faced, what alternatives exist so that people can clearly think about the problems and the issues of the business as it relates to the value proposition, creating a profit, how much of that profit is reinvested for future value propositions, how much goes to shareholders, all of that, and the efficiencies associated with making all of that happen. You are trying, you're not really deciding, you're clarifying and communicating clearly what many of those issues are. You do make decisions as well, but largely what you're doing is trying to create a common organism, if you will, for the organization so people know what's happening. Top management people can make decisions clearly with good data, good information, good insight. First line managers can effectively manage their people. In order to make all that happen in a large organization of say 500 or 1,000 or 10,000 people, there's a lot of people in the middle doing a lot of this clarifying, thinking, deciding, organizing, those same tasks that we described earlier. So there's multiple levels. You want to be thinking about that as well and developing the skills, not just first line skills, but middle management skills and ultimately top management skills. That's what's going on when we talk about management. Now we're going to switch discussion a little bit and talk about what it is that businesses actually are able to do, what they have at their disposal in order to create a value proposition, bring in profits, reinvest those profits, and then continue to do that, continue with the value proposition and create this flywheel, this continuing growing um, feedback system that's continuing to take off and, and sustain itself over time. Essentially, there's three kinds of resources. Natural resources, that is your land, forest, products, goods, and goods made by others. If you're a car manufacturer, you have suppliers that make the brakes, that make the the electronic systems that make the, uh, the upholstery, that make the, the engines, all those various parts. 
but you also have uh, the, the rubber that makes the tires or plastics that make the tires that come from natural gas or from petroleum. Um, those are all the natural resources. So you have physical resources, if you will, that the organization processes. When you think about it, they're scattered all over the country. There's water, there's coal, there's different minerals. You have uh, manufacturers making paper in one place and upholsteries and plastics in another case and electronics in another place. Um, they're all over. Everything is scattered all over the place. Right? The other kind of resources are human resources, people, our abilities, our skills, our experiences, what we were taught, what we know how to do, what our past experiences are our ability to develop new products, add additional insights, create products and services, human capital. And how those human, how individuals interact is a, a, another set of this, which is social capital. Who those people know? Can they get information they need when they need it? How does all of that work? And then the third type of resources is financial resources. That is, dollars and cents, if you need to make an investment in a new, new factory or new building or office building or new computer equipment or whatever, you have financial resources that are not enable you or allow you to be able to do that, right? the funds that you need. So there's these physical things, these human social interaction things and skills, and then there's the dollars and cents factors as well that you take into account. Information, same basic thing. Right? There's a lot of information in organizations about the resources, where they are, how things get done, what you need, what, what transforms from one thing to another, like I mentioned, that natural gas and, and petroleum are used to create plastics. Um, you have to know these things and how this sort of chain of change works. If you want certain products, where do they come from, what's the underlying uh, minerals, Electric cars, who would think that electric cars, you'd have to worry, if you want to make electric cars like Tesla, um, who would think that you'd have to worry about a, where you find lithium in Bolivia in South America? There's, a, there's lithium fields. It's a mineral that you have. That's what you make lithium batteries out of. It turns out the batteries and the use of lithium is one of the, the ability, the, the new kind of batteries that use lithium is one of the, the main things that enables electric cars. You kind of have to know and understand how that all fits together. Knowledge about the natural systems, how it works. Social capital, human capital, you have to know who knows what. Think about it. You want to, you're trying to figure out how to solve a problem in the grocery store. Uh, you're trying to figure out if we have any. Somebody comes up, do we have, I, I noticed there's no uh, Cheerios on the shelf, right? You have to know how to find out if we have Cheerios in the warehouse or in another back, in the back room or whatever. So somebody knows that. The stocking person knows what's in, what's available. So you can find that out. You can make the right phone calls. Got to tell you, a lot of being successful in organizations is knowing who to call. So you become the go-to person. There's a problem in the organization. They come to you and they say, we're trying to figure out if, um, if, there's, if there's any problems in San Antonio, right, in, in your company. Uh, you happen to know a lot of people. You know somebody in San Antonio. You say, I'll check on it. I'll find out what I can find out. And you call your friend in San Antonio and you find out what's going on down there, right? Knowing that, or that those connections and how they connect with technology is another um, important element that you have to manage in business. And then financial, too. How you actually, how money works. It's not as simple as some of us think because of the time value of money, which we'll talk about later. A dollar is not a dollar. A dollar is different today than in the future or in the past because of inflation and the time value of money. And therefore, all of that has to be taken into account. And that time value of money is depending upon how risky the asset is that you're investing in. And as I said, we'll talk more about that uh, in, 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 in later discussions when we talk about capital. So there's the actual physical stuff, and then there's knowledge and information about where it is and how it all fits together and how it works. That's what business is about, those things, OK? What's an economic system? That, when we talk about, you hear people talk capitalism or socialism or communism or something like that, and you say, 
What kind of economic system does that country have, does the U.S. have, or, or a particular politician? What kind of economic system is Barack Obama proposing or operating under versus some, some other Republican of people, Mitch McConnell or someone like that? What is the economic system that's involved? What do we mean when we say an economic system? Right, that's a good question. Well, what we mean is those last two charts that I went through of all of the different things that you need for business, resources, natural resources, physical resources, human resources and capital, financial resources, versus the information about them and all that, an economic system is how that res those resources are identified, distributed, utilized in a society. How that is done is the economic system. How different assets, wheat or corn in the Midwest, how is that harvested, how is it transported, how is it brought to market, how do you go to a store and buy it, how do you get access to corn that is being grown in South Dakota, how do you get access to cars that are built in Japan, right? There's a price that you pay. How is that price determined? All of those things, that's what an economic system is. How you go about solving the problem of distributing all that stuff that we talked about in the last two charts. All right? How do we fill that? How do you decide that? A couple of terms that you hear thrown out are like laissez-faire capitalism. Laissez-faire means you stand away and wait, watch it work. Laissez-faire capitalism means that there's no regulation, people can do whatever they want, which the traditional, you know, um, historic, like middle, middle ages bazaar where people would just go to the store and put their goods on the table, um, that kind of thing is a laissez-faire capitalism. But you, the buyer beware, you might, you might buy something that's a counterfeit or fraudulent or something like that, and that's just the way it is. There's no controls. That's what, that's what um, laissez-faire capitalism is about. There really isn't laissez-faire capitalism in any developed economy, and we can talk about why that is. It's mostly because of what I just said. People it's easy for free riders to come in with counterfeit goods and services and delude or, or uh, defeat the system and cause something that has consequences that aren't immediately tied. For example, selling bad food. If you were in a laissez-faire capital envi capitalist environment, you may go in and sell food that was spoiled and people go home and get sick and you go back the next day and they're gone and there's nothing you can do about it. right? Drugs that don't work, you know, you can have safety problems with safety in cars, those sorts of things. Laissez-faire capitalism, in its pure state, would ignore that and say, "You blew it. You shouldn't have bought it. You shouldn't have bought it." Right? The market wins. That's what we talk about there. State capitalism involves adding some additional rules and laws that control these markets. And socialism, that, that is a little step further, so that there's some protection associated with, um, with the markets. And the markets are regulated on some level. You can't just uh, take advantage of people. There are laws and there are re regulations that preclude that, for example. And then there's socialism, which is the main good means of production are owned not regulated, owned, owned by the government. So General Motors that makes steel, I mean, excuse me, General Motors that makes cars, owned by the government. So the cars are made by the government and sold by the government, and all the profit we talked about goes to the government. Um, electric utilities that make our electricity, they're owned by the government, run by the government, all the profits go to the government. They're not, not that they're regulated, that's state capitalism, but that they're owned by. So essentially the government gets all of the profits. They own all the means of, the means of production. So when somebody says that, the, um, that a healthcare system is socialist, whenever there's regulation in how 
how the sales or how the insurance is purchased. That is an incorrect use of the term because the government is regulating markets, but it's private insurers and private health care providers that provide the service. Medicare, on the other hand, where the government actually pays for and owns essentially the means of production and they outsource to doctors the, uh, the, the actual delivery of the service, that's closer to socialism. The health care system, as in the Affordable Care Act, is not. Medicare is closer, but it's still not really because the doctors don't own the hospitals and the doctors. I mean, the, the state, the government doesn't. There are countries that do own many means of production. China still owns many of its industries, owns certain industries that it produces goods and services, like dams and that sort of thing. In the U.S., almost all of that is owned by, the, uh, by private industry. All right, so that's the difference. Lazy fair capitalism, totally open, government not involved. If you get screwed, you're, you're, it's, you know, it's your problem. State capitalism, people go in, markets are still owned by individuals, but they're regulated. And then socialism, the, uh, the government itself, the, uh, the, the, the overall organizing, governing system of the state owns the production and produces the cars and sells them and all the profits and all that go back to the state and so that's how the process and how the system works. And people are paid based upon, they're paid um, based upon however the government wants to pay them. There's no negotiation associated with that. So that's the, uh, that's the way that the economic systems, the different kinds of economic systems work. The, um, the last chart I'll talk about this morning and then we'll continue with this is what are things to talk about when you think about an economic system? You want to figure out what are the goods and services and how many people, what people actually need, right? If you think about it, when the government is running everything in a socialist system, they are deciding what to make, how much to make, and where to distribute it. So the government is effectively deciding what people want and where they want it, where they get it how they get it, what the prices are, and what the level of quantity is, what the, the level of quality is. So you might, the, the government might decide that you don't need to have a high-end Lamborghini or you don't need to have a high-end uh, Cadillac car to drive. Everybody can have whatever. These are fine, and we, this is how we're going to distribute it. And that's one of the reasons that there's um, such a negative, a negative feeling for that because the government is essentially telling everybody what they can have. In a capitalist system, if people want it, somebody's allowed to make it and create it and give people what they want if they can do it and make a profit at it, right? So individuals tend to have more selection in a capitalist system because individuals can own property and therefore can own a company and can make something and if they can make a profit at it, people can buy it, right? They can buy all the things they need, the resources, the human capital and all that, make it and sell it and buy it and that's all, they're all set, right? The second thing is how will they be produced? That is, do we do individuals own the properties, the plants, or whatever, or <clears throat> is this something that's better consolidated into a large operation? Um, like in many cases, you have electrical utilities that are it's a highly capital intensive. It doesn't necessarily make sense to have two giant electric distribution centers beside each other in competition with one another because it. They then you have a lot of excess um, idle assets or idle capacity, depending upon who wins the battle. Some, the economics sometimes work out that one large operation is better that can still be owned by private citizens, regulated by the government. Those are monopolies that are built, and we'll talk a little bit more about them. But it can also just straight out be owned by the government, in which case that's socialism. All right? And then the distrib distribution problem, how will they be distributed? Is that a system that is by supply and demand, or is there a distribution plan associated with it? And there's also arguments on this with respect to the healthcare system. Is the distribution, uh, is the government deciding how healthcare is distributed or not, is another argument that is made in, this, in the discussions that you hear about, all right? So that's, uh, those are some basic ideas about the economic system, um, where, what the systems are, and what the underlying logic is. In summary, it has to do with the fact that you have all of these 
resources that are scattered around the world, scattered in different places, in different geographies. There's information about them, where they are, how they all fit together, how coal turns into what's needed to produce electricity, how gasoline or petroleum is turned into gasoline, but also into plastics and rubbers and things like rubber-like things that are plastics. Knowledge about all that. You have people that are experts in all these areas. So you have these distributed distributed resources, the economic system figures out how to distribute them, and that could either be totally just let it happen, which is laissez-faire, or it can be totally centralized control, which is socialism. And in the middle of it, there, are, there, are, there is this sort of regulated, you let it happen, but you try not to let anybody take advantage of anyone else, and that's this sort of regulated, uh, regulated capitalism hybrid, as they call it, which is what, as we'll talk about um, next week, how a lot of, how most developed countries operate currently. 